This is Candy from eyes2jesus.blogspot.com and welcome to day 12, I believe. Yeah, day 12 of anti-vlogmas. So here we are, we're just about halfway through and time has been flying, life has been busy, but let's face it, life is always busy. At least it is for me and perhaps it is for you as well. So, <clears throat> uh, we are getting ready to run some errands. We need to get some things handled today. And you might notice from last Sunday, and now here we are today in another Sunday, I haven't been showing or mentioning church. It's because generally we don't go to church for the month of December. Uh, we also stop reading our family devotionals for the month of December. For the month of December, we go through the book of Proverbs for the 31 days correlating with the day of the week. And uh, we just home church and do our own thing for December. Uh, we've tried some years going to church in December, except for around Xmas. Uh, and other years like this year were like, nah, you know, uh, because we just, uh, it's, it sickens me personally. It, it literally makes me feel sick to my stomach to be sitting in a place that's supposed to be the house of God, but um, Christmas carols are being sung and everybody's saying Merry Christmas and there's a Christmas tree up. Do you know what Merry Christmas means? Christmas originated from Christ's Mass. And Christians don't celebrate Mass, by the way. Mass is a secret Babylonian tradition. It has never been a Christian tradition. Um, but Christ Mass, and so when someone says Mary, Christ, Mass, that literally translates to happy death of Christ. Uh, math is Mass is death of Christ. So when you say Merry Christmas, you're saying happy death of Christ. So... It's interesting because Christmas is supposed to be the birth of Christ, but it's actually the birth of Baal. Uh, Baal is also known in the Bible as Tammuz. And we're going to look at Tammuz a little bit here in a few moments in the Bible. So, um, yeah, we don't do um, Christ Mass, and uh, which is actually Baal Mass, but it's not the death of Baal, it's the birth of Baal. So, yeah, people say Merry Christmas, they're saying Merry Death of Christ, Happy Death of Christ. So uh, I thought I would start today's mini vlog by just jumping right into uh, first the re when another reason why I don't celebrate Christmas and then we need to head out and run our errands. I'm taking a few minutes to do this while my daughter is finishing getting ready. So turn with me in your Bible, preferably the Young's Literal Translation to Ezekiel chapter 8. And let's just start reading here in verse 5. And he saith unto me, Son of man, lift up, I pray thee, thine eyes unto the way of the north. And I lift up mine eyes, the way of the north, and lo, on the north of the gate of the altar, this figure of jealousy at the entrance. So he's talking about the, a figure of jealousy at the entrance of the house of God. How does that correlate to today? Well, today we have uh, a lot of uh, churches have uh, Christmas trees just outside, just inside the foyer or foyer, and then inside the sanctuary itself by the altar. They might have uh, holly and greenery and lights decorating the doorway of the church. So they have. So these are images of jealousy. Remember, it's established in Jeremiah chapter 10 that a tree cut down from the forest, set in a tree stand and decorated is no different than a graven or molten idol. Jeremiah chapter 10 teaches us this. Therefore, a Christmas tree is an image of jealousy. So what it's talking about here, whatever the image of jealousy was then, still works for today. That if you're entering in what's supposed to be, quote unquote, a house of God, and there are Christmas trees and Christmas decorations in there, that's an image of jealousy. Verse 6, And he saith unto me, Son of man, art thou seeing what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are doing here, to keep far off from my sanctuary. And again, thou dost turn, thou dost see great abominations. Verse 7, And he bringeth me in unto an opening of the court, and I look, and lo, a hole in the wall. And he saith to me, Son of man, dig, I pray thee, through the wall. And I dig through the wall, and lo, an opening. Verse 9, And he saith unto me, Go in, and see the evil abominations that they are doing here. And I go in, and look, 
And lo, every form of creeping thing and detestable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel graved on the wall all round about. And seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel and Jeaz and Niah, son of Shaphan, standing in their midst, are standing before them, and each his censer in his hand, and the abundance of the cloud of perfume is going up. So they have, they're surrounded by idols and pagan things, yet they still have the censer in their hand with the incense going up, the perfume going up as is what they used to do in the temple as part of the worship of God. So you see that they are doing the acts of worshiping God in what's supposed to be the temple of God, but they're surrounded by idols and pagan things. Verse 12, And he saith unto me, Hast thou seen, son of man, that which the elders of the house of Israel are doing in darkness, each in the inner chambers of his imagery? For they are saying, Jehovah is not seeing us. Jehovah hath not forsaken the land. So they're saying, God doesn't see that I'm actually, you know, wanting to do this pagan thing, you know, translate to today. God's not seeing that I actually really want to do Christmas. He sees that I love him. That's what he's seeing. It's self-delusion. Verse 13, And he saith unto me, Again thou dost turn, thou dost see great abominations that they are doing. And he bringeth me in unto the opening of the gate of the house of Jehovah that is at the north, and lo, there the women are sitting, weeping for Tammuz. That, my friends, is Lent. Now, I've never celebrated Lent. I've, I don't think I've ever even been to any churches that did the whole Lent thing. I didn't even really know what Lent was. But uh, it's a certain amount of days leading up to Easter where you are to fast or give something up, fast from something. And that originated here. This is, these were, this is the original Lent where the women are weeping for Tammuz because Lent, or the women weeping for Tammuz, is about um, weeping over the death of your God, that your God has died. Uh, weeping over commemorating the coming up anniversary of the God's death. And then, people who call themselves Christians, then they celebrate on Easter, Resurrection Day. Yay! Our God has come back to life. This all originated with Tammuz, who is also Baal, originating with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, where secret Babylon religion began. So if they're weeping for Tammuz, that was their Lent. They are fasting and mourning for the death of Tammuz. But you see, Tammuz died, and then Semiramis, or Ashtoreth, comes up pregnant, claiming that she's pregnant with her husband, who is Tammuz, and that he's being reborn through her womb, and that she has not lain with a man, that this is a miraculous birth, that her husband has come back to her through her womb. And so Christmas was when they would celebrate with evergreens. There was evergreen everywhere. They would decorate with evergreens. They would decorate evergreen trees. They would have branches of evergreen, evergreen decorations everywhere, because that were represents eternity and it shows the it was to symbolize the eternity of their God that uh, their God died but their God came back to life and was born again from the womb of Ashtoreth the queen of the heavens as we read about her in Jeremiah chapter 7 so here they are they're doing Lent here they're weeping for Tammuz but then Tammuz will get resurrected right Okay, so now verse 15, And he saith unto me, Hast thou seen, son of man? Again thou dost turn, thou dost see greater abominations than these. And he bringeth me in unto the inner court of the house of Jehovah, and lo, at the opening of the temple of Jehovah, between the porch and the altar, about twenty-five men, their backs towards the temple of Jehovah, their faces eastward, and they are bowing themselves eastward to the sun. And that actually correlates with sunrise service on Easter Sunday, where you are facing eastward at sunrise to have your sunrise service. And we've already discussed uh, that with Easter earlier in this anti-vlogma series and how that came about. Okay, verse 17, And he saith unto me, Hast thou seen, son of man? Hath it been a light thing to the house of Judah to do the abomination that they are having done here, that they have filled the land with violence and turned back to provoke me to anger? And lo, they are putting forth the branch 
unto their nose. Why are they putting forth the branch unto their nose? Well, one, evergreen trees and pine trees and whatnot and cedar trees, they smell good. So they have their greenery because while the women are weeping for Tammuz, which is uh, the death of their God, well, their God, they find out, comes back to life when they find out that Ashtoreth is pregnant and she is claiming that she is pregnant with Tammuz coming back to life. So then they have the resurrection of their God being the baby in Ashtoreth's womb. And then December 25th, Tammuz is born as Baal or Tammuz or Moloch or like these various, you know, Milcom, Molech, Bel, etc., Dagon, all right, different tongues, different groups, had different names for the same guy, and a lot of times Nimrod and Baal are used interchangeably as the same person, and a lot of times they're used as separate as father and son, same thing with all these male deity names. And so Ashtoreth, who is Isis and Diana, by the way, uh, she gives birth to Tammuz. So then we have these people that we read about and they're facing eastward. That's where they're celebrating Easter. Now they're celebrating, okay, well our God has been resurrected because we because it was around that time that they found out that Ashwath was pregnant with who she was claiming it was Tammuz coming back again. And then he was born December 25th. And that is where then they would then set up their evergreen tree and they would decorate it. They would hang their mistletoe, which by the way, uh, if someone was under the mistletoe and you caught them under the mistletoe, you were supposed to fornicate with them. Didn't matter if you were related. Didn't matter if you were the same gender. It didn't matter if you couldn't stand each other. If you're under the mistletoe, then you were to fornicate. And that's where kissing under the mistletoe comes forth from. It's pretty heinous. So here we see the evergreen tying in. They put the branch to their nose because they would put that tree up for December 25th to celebrate that Tammuz was being born from the womb again. And of course we know this was all a deception. This was all Satan's trick at attempting to counterfeit the prophecy given in Genesis 3.15. So that's just another little tidbit and bit of history on Christmas and Easter and Lent and all that. And just another reason why I don't partake in these pagan holidays. Our God is a God of truth. He wants us to walk in truth. And as we learned about yesterday, the true worshipers worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Well, I think my daughter is ready. So uh, we need to go out and run our errands. So got to head out on that. And Miss Rachel, my daughter, is making supper tonight, and she did not let us know what she's making. Uh, what I am making, I'm still not going to say what it is, but uh, one serving of this involves one potato, and I'm going to make uh, ten servings. There's enough for everyone to have two if they're on second. So I'm just getting ten potatoes right now, trying to get like the, the roundest ones I can, so that would be good for this. Alright, so I've got my 10 potatoes here, all uh, washed, and uh, I just uh, rubbed them with some oil, and now I'm just going to sprinkle some salt on, and then they go into the oven for 40 minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The potatoes were cooked, and then I uh, cut off the ends on one, one end of each room and hollowed it out mostly, and then I mixed the... Uh, bits from the inside with uh, sour cream, green onions, uh, cheese, and some seasonings and put that inside the potato and then I wrapped each of them with two pieces of bacon and put some toothpicks to help keep it in place and now I'm brushing some oil onto the bacon and then it's just going to go into the oven for a bit longer. So these were in the oven for a total of 40 minutes just until the bacon is all the way cooked through. So now I'm going to remove all the toothpicks, I'm going to brush the bacon with barbecue sauce, and I'm going to sprinkle some cheese on the tops of these. Uh, we don't have any barbecue sauce, so instead of brushing barbecue sauce onto them, I am doing ketchup. Uh, and then I'll sprinkle some cheese on top, and they will go back in the oven for just a few minutes to melt the cheese, and then they will be done. Alright, they just came out of the oven with all the melted cheese, and the ketchup made the bacon a really nice color. So now all I'm going to do is uh, take them off the baking sheet 
Uh, put a dollop of sour cream and sprinkle some green onions and then they'll be done. And here is the final product. This looks like a very yummy dinner that Miss Rachel made, so I'm getting ready to dig in. You know, there's probably a lot of people out there who are taking comfort in the fact that they think so many other people are doing this Christmas thing. It's got to be okay. But that's a bad thing to take comfort in. You're taking comfort in that most other people are doing something. Scripture warns against that. Look, you can't, you know, expect somebody else to do your homework for you. You've got to know God. And he gave us something to know him by. The Bible. So that you wouldn't have to depend on everybody else. Anyway, it's good for us Christians to do a little iron sharpening iron and make sure that we're all up to snuff. And if one of us thinks somebody else has got it wrong, well, you need to tell him. Because that's how iron sharpens iron. It's the people who don't want controversies to be talked about who are dividing the church. Because if we're already on a different page, we're already divided. We need to talk about what we think the other ones are doing wrong in order to get on the same page. In order to be of one mind, as the Bible calls us to be. <clears throat> of course, those of us who are a little bit more researched can lean hard on the Bible and we can see the flaws in other people's arguments. But I'm going to go ahead and use this piece of paper because otherwise I will be all over the place. I kind of need a little something to help me focus because my mind is all over the place. That's how I fix things. I think about many things at once. But uh, this paper right here will help me stay focused on a pre-designed uh, conclusion that's got the relevant information in it. All right, so here we go. When I was young, I wanted to know what a Christmas tree had to do with Jesus being born, or what eggs and bunnies had to do with Jesus dying on the cross. My parents did not answer these questions. I don't know if my parents didn't know the answer to these questions, or that these are pagan rituals that God hates, but they failed to warn me either way. Thankfully, I now know. The pagan religion is a fertility religion with many immoral practices. Now that I am aware of this, and that Christmas is part of this abomination, I have stopped trying to honor Jesus Christ by doing the equivalent of bringing strippers to a satanic birthday party in Jesus' name. I also wondered why most people, including atheists, had no problem with Christmas, even though the Bible teaches us that the world will hate us when we are actually following Jesus Christ. In the world today, I'm disappointed by many, by the majority of people who call themselves Christians as they are getting along with the world rather than following Jesus when there is a conflict between the two. A majority of Christians seem to not know that the Bible teaches us that those who actually follow Jesus Christ will find the world at odds with them. Jesus Christ himself told us this would be the situation. So how have so many Christians fallen for this Christmas lie? Satan's main tool is lies. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan has been pretty successful with this lies combined with our fallen nature. Jesus was crucified because he told the truth. Well, the prophets of God were killed for telling the truth. Christians are informed about all of this in the Bible. Do you think the prophets were killed because they were telling what people everyone wanted to hear? No, they were telling what people didn't want to hear. The majority didn't want to hear. Be very careful if the majority is doing something. Christians are informed about all of this in the Bible, yet they still have fallen for Satan's lies. There is the conventional, conventional wisdom that people tend to go with, you know, where non-diligent people look around and see that everybody else is doing it, whatever it may be, and think it must be okay. But we are warned against, warned by Jesus against following the crowd in Matthew chapter 7. It tells us that most people are on the wide road to hell, 
and only a few people find the narrow path to heaven. Even lost rock and rollers know that there's a highway to hell, but only a stairway to heaven. Basically, most Christians have fallen for Satan's Christmas lie because they are not diligent. In the Bible, Daniel 7.10, we find out what percentage of humans actually make it to heaven. And it's one out of a hundred. One percent make it to heaven. You need to be diligent. You need to seek wisdom as the book of Proverbs advises. Now I present to you some verses from the Bible to help you accept the fact that your family and friends will think badly of you when you take down the tree idol and cancel the Christmas holiday this year. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus talking. Verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Is the world hating you, Christian? Or are you kind of getting along with everybody pretty darn well? Including all holding hands and doing Christmas. Verse 20. Remember the, world, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Jesus is our Lord, right? We're his servants. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. That means Jesus came and they did what he prophesied they would do to him, which was treat him badly. And, he pro and they will keep, the world will keep that against us, keep doing that kind of thing against us as well. Verse 21, But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They don't know God. So remember, we're here to impress God, not the world. Okay, John 17, verse 13. And this is Jesus talking to God about those of us who actually follow him. The true believers. So here's Jesus. I think it's more, it's almost like, I think Jesus might have been praying to God here. But he's talking to God about us. And so here it is. And now I come to thee, and using these things I speak in the world, that they, the Christians, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, God's word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is Jesus speaking now. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. He doesn't want God to remove the Christians from the world. But that thou shalt keep them from evil. So Jesus is praying that God will protect us as we are here to do his will and to spread the gospel. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What God says is true. Anything that goes against that is wrong. That's why it's so nice to hold a Bible in your hand. It's great to hold a book of truth. Here's verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. He sent us out to preach the word, the good news of the gospel, that God will forgive us if we accept his free gift and believe that he sent Jesus Christ to save us. Without faith, by the way, the Bible tells us it is impossible to please God. Verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The truth sanctifies you. That makes you means makes you clean. Right? Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So all the people who get saved, he is praying this prayer for them too. Verse 21, that they may all be one, on the same page, right? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also might be one in us, 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We need to all be on the same page. Christians going out there, diving into the, the pagan holiday of Christmas, that's not good. That, that's, that's not being on the same page as Jesus and God and those of us who are smart enough to not fall for that, right? Or let's just say, wise enough. You don't have to be smart to be wise. You just have to be informed, right? Verse 22, And the glory which thou givest me, I giveth them. We are glorified by Jesus. That they may be one, even as we are one. It is glorious to be in the truth. It's really great. You know, it's a good feeling when you can walk around sure of who God is, of what right, what's right, what's wrong. Verse 23, I in them, and thou, God, in me, Jesus, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and hast loved me. Isn't that great that we have a loving God? God is so good. That's why he is so fabulous. You know, if somebody was asking to be worshipped, and they had a bunch of flaws, that would be messed up. And that's going to be any of us, right? But God is perfect. God is holy. There is not a thing wrong with him. When you worship him, you're doing the right thing, right? 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Before the world was made, God the Father loved Jesus the Son. And now we are in that circle, right? Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these that have known, and these have known that thou hast sent me. We are knowing God. We know who he is. We know he hates Christmas. We know that when we put up that Christmas tree, which is a phallic symbol, or a wreath, which is a, a, a womb symbol, that God hates that fertility junk being done in his name. That's, it's a slap in the face. Verse 26, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. He will declare it. Boy, I think he's talking there about the, the day when we're before the throne, the great judgment. He's going to call us his. We're going to be in. We're going to be on the right side, you know. Now, uh, the last section here, well, uh, one more section I, I can put in. Uh, from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. That's an important thing to think about. If you, if you think about the day, about the Bible talking about the whole world being burned up and, and, and being redone, but everything here is just going to melt away, if that makes you sad, why, you're attached to the world. How much do you love the world? Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the God abideth forever. You see, it's important to do what God wants us to do. Not just think about it in our mind. Think that somehow if we just ponder it in our hearts, that's close enough. No, we kind of need to go do it. We're supposed to be a light unto God in this world. That means we need to do the right thing to help those around us see what right means, what it looks like. Okay. So, while many Christians act like pleasing the world is a good thing, Jesus Christ told us to take up our cross and follow him. Luke 9 Verse 23, And he said to them all, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Not put it on hold during the Christmas season. Daily. Through the Christmas season. I find it a great blessing that God gives me the chance to go out on Christmas Day and work on the car all day long in the driveway and show other people what we should be doing with our extra time off from work while they do their pagan festivities. Okay, 
So if you're getting along too well with the world, watch out! It's a bad sign. They are on the wide road headed to hell. By definition, as per the words of Jesus Christ, conventional wisdom is the path to hell. And as my sweet wife would say, have a pleasant good day. And it is time to wrap up my day. It's a little bit of a late one tonight. Not too bad, but uh, I still got some uh, things I need to handle before bed. But uh, this concludes today's vlog. Have a blessed day.